So we talked about parallel processing. We explained what parallel processing is, and we said since 1998, uh, the capability of writing processes that are going to run at the same time has been added to, OOP, uh, to uh, C++. And uh, it is in a thread library, which uh, essentially uh, the, the whole structure of C++ changed since then. Over there, we used to have, like, before 98, we had a straight program coming down, uh, running uh, sequentially, and every single process that halted stopped everything. If you wanted to do something uh, in several processes, you had to get a, a, um, an outsider library from some company who wrote to be able to do uh, parallel processing. But they then brought it into C++. So what they did, they, they, they changed the structure of the whole language in which every single thing run in, in, in threads. So even the program you're running, your main, is thread number one. You can keep adding threads to it, OK? So the, um, we showed that we can have uh, 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 several different threads running uh, uh, a function. So essentially, main is the function that, you, that, that runs first. So essentially, that's your main thread. Then you can add any type of function that we learned, lambda, functor, functions, any type of function to run uh, at the same time as main is running, OK? And uh, uh, we said using thread, well, we can actually get the function and pass the arguments to the function. The catch is that threads don't return anything, which means you cannot return any value with those functions. Only void functions, the functions that return nothing, can be passed to thread. The remedy for it was to pass a reference of a variable uh, through the argument list uh, to the function and return the values like that. The problem was that if you want to pass a, uh, a reference through an argument of the thread, it won't accept it. That you have to wrap it into a reference wrapper and pass that one, and that fixed the problem, and we returned values back from the threads, and life was beautiful. So we started writing programs that run in parallel. Um, and we actually tested it. We see things going like that. And then we said we want to take control of these threads and be able to stop one thing, run another thing, and to be able to uh, make these things communicate with each other, which uh, brought us to the concept of uh, creating endless loops to pause the threads and then uh, access those endless loops using uh, a common reference variable that we have in our main thread, um, which said it sucked because it, it it doesn't pause the execution. It literally makes the CPU busy, which you don't want to do that. We want to pause the execution. For that, we uh, went to the concept of uh, doctor's offices washrooms. And we said that we're going to have a key uh, in the office. Whoever wants to go to the washroom gets the key, goes to the washroom, comes back, leaves the key at the office. And then whoever comes and picks up the key first can go get the rest. We call those things mutexes. So a mutex is essentially a key that you create and you lock it. When it's locked, everybody else is looking to see when it's getting unlocked. As soon as it gets unlocked, they pick it up, they lock it, so now they are in. Any process that holds the unlocked mutex executes, and when it's done, it unlocks the, uh, it unlocks the thing. So it's literally a key to do the process. And that was the last thing we have done. So we actually <sighs> created a process like this. We said we have a mutex called key. Uh, we lock it in main and then execute the two threads. In our threads, we pass a couple of lambdas. And in that lambda, we said, lock the key and unlock it. This action will not take place if the key is already locked. It has to wait for it to get unlocked. So there's a compact because thread X and Y are running at the same time, they're both checking the, the lock. Whoever grabs it first is going to unlock and get in, and therefore the other one cannot go in anymore. So that's the process that happens, and therefore uh, uh, we said that it's kind of a uh, stupid thing. Instead of writing the whole thing in one line, because <laughs> if we just executed the functions back to back in one thread, 
the mission was accomplished, but that wasn't the case. We want to see how we can actually get into our threads and do stuff with it. And these are uh, important things. Like, for example, you have several, that, um, several threads are, that are doing certain uh, a search in a huge, vast amount of information. So what you do, you break that information into 10 pieces and give it to 10 threads. And you're looking for one thing. And all these threads are searching right now. If that's the case, if one of them finds it, it has to tell to others, hey, I found it, okay? We can do it with a common uh, variable, a common message in memory that we are going to set, but to write that thing and make sure there is no conflict before writing in that, we have to lock everybody else, then write that I found something and it was success and unlock it and everybody else see that, uh, all the other threads see that, oh, something is found, they quit their execution and they get out. So mutexes are needed to, to, uh, to access common data. You cannot both write in, in the same piece of memory with a thread because you'd have no idea what the outcome is going to be. Okay? Because of that fact, mutexes are there to lock something and you can have several mutexes for different purposes. Um, it, doesn't need, it doesn't have to be one. You can have three mutexes passed to a, to a thread and each one of them is to access something somewhere that other threads are accessing at the same time. So all these things are... Uh, 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 so th the reason we are doing this, we are trying to... We have uh, three threads over here. Two in case, two? Oh yeah, we have one, two... I don't think I'm doing anything in the main. Am I calling it in the main too? No. So I have two threads over here that I want to put in sequence just to practice, see how I can do it. Again, this example is kind of stupid because I am doing a multi-threading, then I'm stopping one thread, <laughs> waiting for it to finish and do this. So essentially, you know, I'm going back to, but it's just for practice. So that's what we have done. And we said you have to lock the key and unlock the key. That process brings us back to allocating memory and deleting memory which sucks because you always forget to deallocate. And if you forget to unlock something, just imagine you go to a washroom, you lock the, co the, lock the door, and <laughs> you come out and you still lock it. You, don't, you forget to unlock and you forget to give the key back to the office. It means the washroom is occupied forever. We do not want that. We, wa we do not want the three things to remain locked. Because of that fact, we have something like the uh, smart pointers, but it's for mutexes. So um, what I can do instead of locking the key over here, as you see, I can actually say, let me just see, I can actually, instead of locking and unlocking, I can put it over here like this, just remove this lock thingy over here, and I can say lock guard and the lock guard of mine essentially is for a mutex. And I'm going to say lock guard, and I'm going to put the key in it. So what happens, this lock guard of mine will actually, this LG has no point over here other than creating a local variable in this scope to force the destructor to be called. So if you do not have a specific time that you want to unlock the key, and you want to unlock the mutex, and you want the mutex to be unlocked at the end of the scope, that's your friend. You simply say lock guard mutex LTG. So what happens, this becomes a wrapper around the key with a constructor and a destructor. So you just constructed it. When the scope is over, it's going to automatically unlock it. So you don't have to worry about it. It becomes an automatic lock. And I can do the exact same thing over here. Therefore, I do not need to worry about it. And that, ladies and gentlemen, we call it a, a lock card. So it works the exact same way with absolutely no difference. It locks and unlocks, but it just does it automatically. So in case you want to uh, use, uh, um, you want to lock the mutexes, that's what you do. And as you see, it's running in two different, uh, believe me, it was the, the top was all carrots. And I want to scroll up for five minutes. Anyway, so that's that, okay? So that's lock guard. 
that we need to uh, know about. Um, again, I, if, if, you do, if you do not, and it doesn't have any methods, anything. It's just that. It just locks the key and unlocks the key when it's done. Okay? Now, um, there is another version of this thing that is newer. Okay? Like, like if, be careful, if you're running my examples over here, make sure that you set the target to be 17 or 20. You cannot go C++ 14 with this. It's not going to work for the next one. Okay? So the next one that we have over here, we call it a scope block. So this is uh, lock guard. So what was the last thing we did? We were at H, right? E, F, G, H, H, I. So I, pardon me? Yes, I am recording it. Am I recording this? Yes, it's recorded 10 minutes and 51 seconds now. Okay. <laughs> I hope that it, last time it was all blank. For some reason, it could all was black. No, no video. I don't know what happened, but anyways. So, yeah. So that's I lock guard. Uh, yeah, lock guard. That's it. Now, the next one, it works exactly like a lock guard, but it's a, uh, it's a more efficient one. And the most important thing, uh, scope lock. What am I doing? Scope, scope lock. Uh, so scope lock is exactly like lock guard, but the difference is that with scope lock, you can have five mutexes. So you can say, so you can say scope lock, uh, mutex, comma, mutex, comma, mutex, and then MT1, MT2, MT3. So you can have three mutexes locked up and down, so you can do it. It works the exact same way, but it actually uh, works on multiple mutexes. So, so if I put it like this, it's the exact same thing. In our case, I have only one mutex, so it doesn't matter, but it could have been more. So I could have done this. So for lock guard, I'm just going to add this comment over here. For, for, for scope lock, I'm going to add, so uh, can get multiple mutexes as follows. So you can say scope lock, mutex, mutex, and then put those things over there. So it does several mutexes if needed. And it works the exact same way. Just let me compile and make sure it runs. Yeah, so what did I do? Oh, <laughs> I stopped it and, it and it ruined the thing. So let me just run it one more time. Okay, it didn't work. That's interesting. So you cannot pause the screen with threads because they are running parallel. This one, the window that terminal that gets open is tied to main thread. So if I, pa it, like with the other ones, you can pause the, the output and then continue again. In here, you pause the output, the other two threads are running in the background, so we won't be able to see a thing. I just want to, wanted to uh, bring the output session over here. There you go. So it's coming out. Um, as you see, the number of characters printed are much smaller than what I had when I was actually teaching from home because my computer is much faster over there. And this one is not. So that's that. Um, next thing uh, is working with threads. So, so uh, I need a vector here. So, I can have, let, let's uh, uh, go back to uh, counting the number of things we can do. So I'm going to, uh, in a second. So what I'm, um, what I'm going to do over here, I'm going to create a function, and that function of mine is receiving uh, uh, um, a, a number n that uh, starts from zero and goes to, up to something. So it actually tells how many things it can print in a second, okay? So, um, and I'm going to start passing information to it and call it in threads to see um, the exact same thing that we have done with several uh, th uh, threads to see how many things we can actually uh, print, uh, how many characters we can print in a second. 
So uh, we're going to have the exact same uh, 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 routine that we had, which is essentially having uh, TX, TY, and TZ. These are the number of uh, prints that are going to be done with individual uh, uh, threads running, and I'm going to set them to null initially. And then I'm going to say from now, let's count three seconds. So I want to see how many things are getting printed in three seconds. Then I'm going to create a vector of type thread. So I'm going to create a vector of type thread. Let's call it threads. OK? So now I have a vector of type thread. And what I can do is to say threads dot pushback, and I will pass that function into it that is cares, and I'm going to put a reference wrapper around the first one, which is ref tx, and say uh, the number of uh, seconds that I want to seconds, and let's say character caret. Where is it? There you go. So So my, my push, oh, sorry, I'm pushing a thread. OK, so I, did I, I didn't talk about R-A-I-I, -I, did I? I? Did I say what is R-A-I-I? -I? OK. Uh, I think really with resource allocation is initialization. I think that's the thing. Now, check it, read the thing, you'll see. What does it mean? Um, and I think I mentioned that the other day, but I'm going to mention it now too. When you instantiate a thread, that's the moment of execution of that thread. So creation, allocation of the thread is its initialization and execution at any moment. So remember, you create a thread, you cannot say run. You created it, it runs. That's the time that it runs. If you want to pause it, you have to lock it before. So you have to have a lock. Lock it up, first, first lock at the top, then create the threads. Now you can put everything in hold, and then you can unlock any of them that you want and make them run if you want to. Or you can, like for example, you have 20 threads over here of something, 30 threads over here of something. You want first these run and then the other ones. You build all the threads. You create two mutexes. You pass one to this, the other one to that one. You lock them both. You come, you unlock one. The 30 at right is going to run, and after it's done, then you unlock the other one, and so on and so forth. So this is so you can actually go through execu uh, uh, executing every and each of them one by one as so. Yeah. So in here, I can actually start pushing more. So I'm going to push three threads over here. Uh, the other one is going to be, for example, with a dash and a plus over here, and this one is going to be ty and tz. Okay. And now, after I'm done to join them, I'm simply going to say for auto uh, uh, t in threads. And I'm going to say t.join. And I'm going to join them back in. And now I can actually print them one by one to see how many characters each one of them could print in uh, three seconds and run the program. Now we have the threads inside a mutex, and it's running everything as you see in parallel. And again, as you see, much smaller number of characters are printed over here. Uh, and I forgot to go to new line, I think, afterwards. So. So that's that working with uh, threads and vectors. All right, so that's I, J, that's uh, thread vector. Is there a question? No question? OK. I can do the exact same thing over here instead of having variables created like that. Like, this is kind of as if you're writing in C when you think about it, okay? To make this object-oriented, what I can do is 
to actually create a functor instead and have all the information that I want in that class. Um, one of the things that about functors is that when you actually create a functor, people think that it's a function object. So its main purpose is the function. Yes, the main goal of the functor is to execute a function. But remember, a functor is stateful. A function uh, is not. In a functor, I can actually see how many number of characters I had over there. I can check to see what I want to. I can say, so I don't have to have some global variables over there to show exactly what I want to print. So instead of actually doing that, I can create three instances of, of my function. So instead of doing something like that, I can say create the, the functor cat tx with caret, ty with this, and tz with that. And because they are all initialized with to zero, the number of characters are going to be zero over there. And therefore, when you are actually uh, pushing the thread into this one, um, instead of actually uh, passing the thread in, um, where is the thread? Over here. So. So instead of pass, passing the, the cares over here, I can actually pass the functor. And my functor only accepts the seconds. So it's only one argument, and I do not need to mention what I want to print. So it's more object-oriented, but it serves the same purpose. OK? So. All right. Joining is exactly the same, but the difference is that to print actually how many things are printed over here, what I will do over here is to say, hey, TX, how many characters you printed? TY, how many you? TZ, how many you? The only difference over here is that this one is an object-oriented thread running, not uh, some functions that I created. And if I run the program, it works the exact same way. It keeps going to the other side. Ah, there we go. And as you see, the number of things printed is almost the same, which means it doesn't make any difference with the performance of an execution. A function does not run faster than a functor. It's the same thing. They are the, the same thing, and they work the same way. So that's functors, and, and uh, let me not, not close it and see if it's going to make it better. So uh, this one is going to be. Uh, K uh, thread vector with functors. And the next one. <clears throat> to apply mutexes is the exact same way. So there is. Uh, if you want to apply mutexes with vectors, uh, it works the exact same way. So you're going to have the scope block over here with the mutex, set it up, pass the mutex as a reference to the, to the function that you have, create the mutex uh, uh, in here. Where is it? Create the mutex in main, lock it, and pass the reference of the mutex to your function as it goes through. So that puts everything in sequence. And when it runs, everything runs in sequence. So now I have access. It's the exact same way that I've done with the other one, but uh, the functions are inside uh, the, th uh, the thread right now. And uh, the, the, thre uh, the, the threads are inside the vectors right now and runs the same way. So again, uh, I pass the mutex to the function. I, I scope lock it at the beginning of the function. Um, then uh, I, well, oh, let me just. Then I lock the, uh, the, uh, the mutex before I create my threads. It means the threads won't run. They will pause. And then I will say go, and I unlock. Now it becomes a race between the three. Which one is going to grab the mutex first? And that one's going to start the execution right after. And uh, that's how you... Do it with mutexes <coughs> in vectors. It works the exact same way. Now this one, carrot picks up first, and then that one. Let me see if it's going to change the change. 
Next time. Oh, next time actually started with dash. So next, the other one, dash one. So as you see, the other one, dash one first. That's the one who picked up the mutex first. Okay. <clears throat> so that's that. Uh, Now, I have a question. I have a question. My question is, when a promise is made, you make a promise to your little sister, where are you going to actually do it? When are you going to do it? It's always in future, right? So you keep a promise in future, always. Does that make sense? Okay, that's why they named it that way. <laughs> we have a promise and we have a future. So we have a promise object and we have a future object in multi-threading. Because threads execution and when it wants to return something, we don't know when is it going to be actually done. Each thread can make you a promise. And in future, you can act, it keeps the promise. So essentially you can get the, the value of the promise in future. And there has a, there's a syntax behind it that I'm going to tell you. So you can literally, when you want to get values inside your threads, you can actually have promises uh, in your uh, uh, threads kept. And after all the threads are done, you can get the values in future. Okay? So let me show you how it's done. <clears throat> so... Let's say I want to find the sum of uh, um, numbers uh, between 0 and, I can't even read that number. I'm not going to even try. And I'm going to, let me just create the type for it. So I'm going to say type def uh, unsigned long long, and I'm going to call it ULL because I don't want to keep typing that thing. <laughs> Over and over, okay? So that's an unsigned long, long. And and in my main, I'm going to have an unsigned long, long. Beginning, that is zero. And I'm going to have an end, that is uh, one, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three, one. I think... When I tested it, this was long enough to give us some pause for, for running. So essentially, I'm going to do 0 plus 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 4. Go that much up to that number and sum them all up. And that's a big process. It takes a long time. Okay? So I want to see how can I break that one into pieces and make the thing run faster. Okay? So the very first thing that I have to do, I have to make, create a promise... To create the promise, I think I have to include future. Because promises are kept in future. Remember that, right? So I need a, I have thread, I have IO stream, and I need to include future. Okay, so I'm gonna make a promise of type unsigned long long and I'm gonna call it some promise so this is the promise I am making to keep the sum in it then what I will do is creating a future so I'm gonna say future unsigned long long some future will be equal to some promise dot get future. Okay? So, this some future of mine doesn't have anything in it. In future, it's going to get the promise. So, 
what you do in your threads you set the promise to the value that you find you come back in your calling thread in your main thread you tell to your future give me the promise so I can get the results back out am I making sense <laughs> okay so let me write the function for it so first of all promises cannot be copied it has to be unique so I have to pass the promises around from one place to another a promise cannot be just kept in some place so so what I will do I will create a function <coughs> call it sum and I'm gonna say promise <coughs> unsigned long long and I'm gonna move it over here so that's my sum promise and I'm going to start from the beginning and go to the end. And in here, I'm going to say unsigned long, long sum. That is 0, and i is the counter. So I'm going to say 4, i set to beginning, i less than or equal to end, and i plus plus. And s plus equal, actually, no, s plus equal i plus plus. Is that okay if I do that? Or some people, people get scared when I do that. There you go. Is that better? So I'm finding the sum over there from here, and, and it says. So this loop finds the sum of all those things in the s. Are we okay with that? Everybody's good with that? Problem? Why you look like a question mark to me? Huh? Processing. Processing. Okay, it's just a loop. IPC 144. I'm just finding the sum of stuff. Okay? And then after doing this, I'm going to say, hey, sign promise. Set your value to S. So now my sum over here will set the value of promise after it's done. So then what I'm going to do, I'm going to create a thread over here. So I'm going to say, let's start the process in here. So I'm going to say, see out, start, start the process. Okay. And then I'm going to create a thread. So I'm going to say thread T1 um, and I'm going to pass the sum and I'm going to move the sum promise to it okay I'm going to say start from beginning and go to the end this <laughs> is no multi-threading I'm just doing one thread for now and I'm going to add to the threads as I'm going and I'm going to break it down so that's that then I'm going to say see out over here I'm going to say doing the math so the math is going to be done over here. OK. And I'm going to say C out. The sum is. Now I'm going to go to the future, because it's the future now, right? Now I'm going to say sum future dot get. OK. And now I'm going to say T1 dot join. Okay? Are we okay down to this point? Hopefully. Are we good? He's not satisfied. Are we okay? It's only one process, but I'm going to break it down now. So when I run the process, it's going to run like this. It's going to go like this, and it's, it's going to say the sum is, and it finds the sum. So that's the number. It took that long. Okay? Are we okay with this? Now, let me break it down into pieces and try to make it faster. What do I do? So I'm going to create three promises. So two, three. So this is, please supervise me. Make sure that I'm naming these things correctly. One, one, and one. And then I have two, two, and two, right? OK. Now, I'm going to have three threads over here. Oh, that's four. We could make it four, but three is fine. So in here, it's going to be two and three. Okay? So this one is going to move promise nothing and promise one and promise two, right? So we have three promises now. 
Okay? This one goes beginning to end divided by 3. This one is going to go beginning that uh, end uh, beginning of this one will be end divided by 3 plus 1 and it stops at end 3 multiplied by 2. Are we uh, am I right with this? It's it's good, right? And then it, this one is going to have to start from n2 plus 1 and go to the n. I think I'm good. We're good? It's broken into three pieces, right? So now three threads are going to, to go through this and actually uh, calculate this. And in here I'm going to say, obviously, T1, T2, and T3, 3. And in here I'm going to say, some future get plus one dot get plus two dot get and run forest run so now it's going to happen in three and the sum is tada you see like i i wish i could bring it it's much faster like if I actually do it once, you will see it. This is almost three times faster. Um, go put a chrono before and after and comment it. You will see that it's going to run faster. Okay? So that's essentially what a promise in a future is. Okay? And now we have objects after it's done. And we, the, I give you the next example. Please go read the notes. Okay? There are different types of things that they actually return futures to you. So they actually create promises and return it to you automatically. And I'll tell you how, it, how that works. So are we okay with this uh, promise thingy that I made over here? Are we good? All right. So. So, uh, LM promises kept in future. Oh, CPP. Oh, future became future, I think. Yeah. <laughs> That's okay. You know what I meant by that. Okay, I'll, 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 <laughs> I'll rename it. Okay. So, now... Let's go back to our number of characters that we printed. So I'm going to have it, I have chrono over here. So there you go. So we have the chrono again, and we have the, the, the characters over here that I'm printing. And this is, uh, uh, it sets the character, and it tells how many seconds print the characters. And this one returns the number of characters. Please be advised. What's the difference? All the things we have done down to this point, we said you cannot return a value in your functions. You have to pass references to your thread. In here, I'm saying your function can actually return the result. And how does the re result, how the re result, bleh, how the result is returned is actually using a future of that type. Okay? How? You will see. So the difference between this functor or function or whatever you use with the other one is that this one is returning the value that I want to get. The other one's actually return the reference, and I have the reference wrapper and all those good stuff. So I'll create my my uh, functors and all the good stuff that I want, as you see. And let's make this one plus so it's more visible. Okay. So I have the characters set over there. Now I'm gonna, I need to get a future, right? So I'm going to say future, future int. Now instead of a thread, I'm going to say run an asynchronous function for me called tx and pass seconds to it. So what happens over here is that 
that async, why is it giving me an error over here? Ooh. Am I making a boo boo? What does it say? No one says I'm going to get a future. Mm -hmm. This should be correct. So future. Oh! It's no, future is not capital, it's lowercase. Future int, future int. Oh, I have to name it. Future. There you go. Yeah, so future f1 will be the return value of async. So async, what it does, because the function tx over here is returning an integer, the type of future it returns is f1. Therefore, at the end, f1, you can get the result of the return type, of the return value of tx in the future f1. Am I making sense? No, I'm not, am I? So in here, I can actually do this. I can go two and three. Again, RAI, I remember, as soon as async is called, if you don't want them to call, then you have to create the lock and all the things that you know, okay? So now in here, I can actually say int x is equal to f1.get plus f2.get plus f3.get. So now the three processes are actually running, and, uh, and they are running at the same time. I'm going to say C out. Now, in your case, it's kind of um, interesting uh, to let you know uh, that um, why am I putting Y and Z over here? Oh, I don't want the sum. I want the individual one. Uh, integer y. Integer z. X, y, z. Pardon me? 21 and 22. Oh. TX, TY, TZ, you're right, absolutely. TY, TZ, yeah. <clears throat> so, I think we're good. All right, now, let me run it so you'll see what's going on. <clears throat> so, it's actually running it at the other side, and just let me show you something in here. Do I have it here? There we go. OK, so that's, those are my CPUs on this computer. And let's make this one 10 seconds. 15 seconds is fine. So I want to see 15 seconds, OK? So that's that. Now if I run this, see what happens. So now the process is running over there. Okay. This one it didn't work. Actually, it kind of. So you see, one, two, three. Probably these are the threads that are actually running. The ones that are lower are not the ones that are that were. Oh, actually, it was this one, this one, one, two, and this one. So these three. These were the ones that were actually running the thing. You see, they actually looked, looked, looked alike too. And that's, that's the outcome. Okay? So it, if you have several cores running a multi-thread application, really goes faster. Really, really goes faster. Okay? Now, what I wanted to say was mutexes.
we don't have it in the outline. So it's not in the curriculum, okay? You're not gonna be questioned for it in, my, in final on it. Go read it. There are no talking of what mutex is. So we're not gonna do mutexes, okay? I want it, because for me, just writing this without knowing mutex is, just didn't make sound fair. Like, you think you know multi-threading, but you really don't. <laughs> you have no control on threads. To control your threads, you need mutexes. So that's what we did. So the only thing we are going to test you on is async, not threads, okay? So that's gonna be your, uh, that's the thing that you're gonna focus on. It's the easiest one, there's like, it returns a future, you put stuff in it, you just put it and run it and you do it, so that it's as easy as that, okay? With threads, go play, okay? And later on, hopefully, if you go to, uh, I think it's a CUDA programming, what is that, it's, uh, that it, there's a course, a GPU programming. With GPU programming, then you're gonna need all these things. Because if you go to GPU programming, then you have like 4,000 CPUs on a, on a graphic card, right? And that's when you actually put a vector of 4,000 threads running at the same time, and it's going to be awesome. Like, you'll see how, how quick it's going to process what you're processing, okay? So that's that. That's the, the multi-threading stuff. Questions? Yes? So each of your guys, like, each GPU has a different number of threads. So, like... Each GPU doesn't have this. Each... each each, uh, each GPU has several CPUs, for, depending on what you have. Like it, says, it has four, like the high-end ones, they have 4,096 CPUs, but those CPUs are not like uh, i7 CPU. They are very simple CPUs to do a specific type of task. You were saying? Eight. Okay, remember at the beginning of the semester, I showed you the third argument of main called ENV, right? One of the things it returns is number of CPUs. So you can simply see how many CPUs you have on your computer and make, make your vector push back to your vector that many things and not more, as easy as that. But again, as I mentioned, don't think that if you have one CPU, parallel processing doesn't go faster. It will, especially if you have bottlenecks around, okay? If you have processes that you know it's gonna slow you down, so you can simply say, okay, while you're doing this, I'm gonna do all these three too. Your program still going to, is going to run faster. But, uh, so, so multi, -pro like, you know how long you had Windows? Like Windows, like Windows 3.1, I'm going, like, I'm talking about ancient history, the time probably you weren't born yet, okay? So those operating systems were all multitask operating systems. You had a window and a thing and a clock running and all. How did they work? At the time, we didn't have like 16 cores running on a laptop. It was like you had a CPU and if you were lucky, you had a coprocessor, we called it. Okay, still that works over there too. And then hyper-threading came through and so on and so forth. So uh, um, it's much faster if you don't need to have that much of a process. And but if you don't have too many bottlenecks, then running it to the number of your cores is a very efficient way. Let's put it that. Any other question? Suggestion? Objection? All right. Okay, so that's that. Uh, I'm going to post these. <coughs> uh, and I'm just going to... Uh, let me just uh, pause, the, pause the thing. I forgot to mention something extremely important to you. Um, <coughs> uh, uh, that is... Uh, uh, standard template library standard template library. Like for example, if you want to do a search or if you want to do sum and things like that, <clears throat> if you want to do stuff like this, actually standard template library does it for you automatically, which means all the algorithms that you see, it receives a first argument and that first argument tells to that algorithm how to actually execute 
your algorithm. So um, I'm going to bring up the example. So again, <clears throat> to, to show you what I mean. So in here, when we talked about, <clears throat> uh, so this is like when I was talking about what threads and all the good stuff are. And then we'll go to execution policies. You see? Execution sequence policy, execution parallel policy, parallel unsequenced policy. So you see the, all these things? Go read about them and see how, what does it mean. Okay, so essentially a sequence policy, it means everything's got sequential. Parallel, it means they're in parallel. Parallel unsequenced uses certain type of uh, um, uh, algorithm to go through the uh, execution and see what's going to uh, uh, be running faster. So, um, and it's actually, uh, the policy, so they have a name like this as you see, okay? So if you go to SDL, all the things that you have done, count, equal, fill, find first, if, all the stuff that you have done, you can pass the execution policy to it. You see, STD, reduce execution bar x begin at x n. So you are saying, I want this reduction that I'm doing from here to there to be done parallel. So this reduce algorithm will run multi-threaded efficiently based on the number of CPUs. You have the most efficient way that it can run it. It will run it and uh, it will do it for you. So the things that you ran, like you wanted to sort or you wanted to find uh, something inside, uh, uh, t take a look at all the, all the things that we have over here. So all these things that you have and you want, you want to take a look and see how, like if you want to, if you want to do any, doing any of these things where you actually uh, do certain type of process on a vast amount of data, you can actually ask C++ to do it for you in a multi-thread threaded way. Of course, that doesn't answer everything, but if you, are, you were doing what I did, adding numbers from beginning to the end, you can do it over here. And ask that one to do it for you so you don't have to think about uh, futures and promises and things like that. It just does it for you. So uh, that's that. Go through it. Uh, there, the examples over here are, are uh, perfectly sound and shows you exactly how it's done. So uh, you will see that uh, if it's done uh, sequential or parallel, the other one is uh, slower than the other one. Let me just, it's easy. I can just copy it and run it for you and so you can see what I mean. So this one was uh, uh, async, L-M-N. <clears throat> so as you see over here, why is it doing this? Seriously, the thing has an error? for Intel 9.1. Okay, so this is not Intel 9.1. <laughs> okay, so if I run this, it's doing the process. There you go. Parallel happened 83 milliseconds. Sequential happened in uh, 400 milliseconds. Serial that much. So you see, it actually, it, it really matters. Like using those things, just, just take a look at this difference on the same computer, same process, happening three times with three different strategies. See what happened. Yes. Uh, I don't actually know quite frankly. I never use those things. I usually do my own, but, but I don't think it's by default. You actually have to pass parallel. You have to actually mention that I want it to be parallel. You have to mention to be sequential. Pardon me? Oh, normally? Just serial. This one. Here. Accumulate. 
It's just a serial. Okay? So it's the same thing. No difference. Um, so by default, uh, you can use the libraries without the, uh, without the uh, parallel processing, and it literally becomes linear. And when it becomes linear, that, that's going to be the one, and you don't want that. Anyways, questions? Go through them, please. Come with questions if you have any questions. But these are, are you can just uh, uh, take a look at them. There is nothing special to talk about it. Just all the things that the, with, with the SDL library that, that, that we learned that works on collections and doing the same process on massive amount of information, you can tell it how to do it, and it will do it for you. Anyways, and let's call that one uh, LMN O S T L built in multi threading. And that's that. All right. Get the book Tour of C. Uh, that's written by the person who actually m created C++ language, so that's a uh, bonus. And uh, yeah, um, actually, I like this one too. Um, it's not. Uh, it's uh, the. I don't know for some reason I click and it doesn't come, uh, but uh, anyways, it doesn't come through. Seriously, what's going on? Anyways, so, yeah, but this one is a little old, okay? Uh, um, it's not C++17 and stuff like that, uh, and this one too, but it's still, uh, it, it covers many things that you need to know, okay? Anyways, Tor of C++ latest edition, okay? Get that one, and it makes your life a little beautiful. 